Hello class, we're going to talk today in this video about something called price controls. And in our short little time together, I've got a couple of key learning objectives, things I'm going to try to cover. First up, I'm going to talk about what price controls are. We're going to talk about examples of price controls. And you're going to see something called a price ceiling or a price floor. So you'll be able to see the difference between these graphically and understand what they actually are describing as well. We're going to talk about real-world examples of price ceilings and price floors. And then finally, we're going to use some supply and demand analysis here to better understand the impact. Right? What's going to happen in the real world when a government decides to use price controls? Okay. So to begin with, we should recognize that in most cases, governments will allow prices to fluctuate. Right? And the actual price that you pay for gasoline, or for coffee, or for shirt or something like this is going to be determined by the supply and demand for that product. Right? Markets determine prices usually. There are examples though, there's cases where we're unhappy with the outcome. Right? We get a price determined by supply and demand and we think that that price is either too high or too low. And when that occurs, there are policies that we can use to change that price. Right? These are our price controls. So think of a price control as a law that is being put into place that's going to create either a maximum price that we're going to allow or a minimum price that can be charged. So let's first start with the case of something called a price ceiling. Right, so a price ceiling is going to be used when you think that the equilibrium price of some product is too high and we want to bring it down to a level that's more manageable for consumers. Right, so we're worried about people buying the good that the price that they face is not fair, or it's not in society's interest that they have to pay this high of a price. Let's set up a supply and a demand graph to help with this. Right, so I'm going to put price and quantity, abbreviated by P and Q, on my two axes. And I want to situate, uh, I want to draw in here a downward sloping demand curve that looks just like that, that's representing the behavior of all the buyers of the good, and then an upward sloping supply curve that just like this, that's going to represent the behavior of all the people selling the good. Right? So again, if we take a hands-off approach, then the actual price that we're going to all pay will be corresponding with this spot right here on our graph. Let's call this P1. Right? So let's suppose that's our equilibrium price, and then the quantity that falls directly underneath this intersection would be Q1. That's the amount of the good that people are buying and selling. All right, so that's what we're going to get with supply and demand. However, there's occasions where prices are thought to be too high, right? You might be able to think of products that you think are just too expensive. Gasoline, textbooks, clothing, cell phones, whatever it is, right? If we're interested in doing so, we can put in place a law to bring down this price. And the way we would do so is by instituting a price ceiling, okay? Price ceiling is simply a government-mandated maximum price that's going to be allowed. Right? We create some threshold and say any price below that ceiling is okay, but it cannot go up above that. That becomes against the law. Right? So that's pretty straightforward. The way that you're going to want to model a price ceiling is by drawing a horizontal line that looks just like this. So this would represent our price ceiling. And so what that means is that any price that's below this cutoff would be acceptable, right? However, that's the maximum price right here at that line. Maybe we'll call this P sub C for price ceiling. The price cannot be up here at P1 or anything up above PC on that graph. Okay, so that might look good at first glance, right? We're going to see some cheaper prices for people buying the good. There's a problem, though with price ceilings like that, and that is that it distorts this equilibrium that we saw before. For this given new price, P sub C, we can read over horizontally and then see how buyers and sellers of this product are going to respond. So we read over from P sub C, and the first curve that we run into is that supply curve. And so what that means is that at this price, the quantity that falls right here, let's call this QS, would represent the amount of that good that's available for sale. Further, if you read over from PC further, you're going to get to the demand curve, 
And just as your logic might tell you, buyers are going to think that this lower price is a good thing, and they're going to want to buy larger quantities of the good. So the new quantity demanded at this price, PC, would be way over here. And so the problem arises when you have the situation that quantity demanded is in excess or is more than quantity supplied. And so what we have then is a shortage. This government mandated artificially low price is designed to help out consumers by giving them something that's more manageable. The negative consequence or the negative impact is that it can lead to a shortage. So you don't see this too often. However, there are some real world examples of price ceilings that have been put into place. One good example is rent control, where governments, in an attempt to help out folks that are having a hard time paying really, really high rents will create a law that the rent that's being charged can't go above some threshold. That's a price ceiling. And so you'll see this in really desirable places to live, New York, Los Angeles, things like that. The negative consequence, though, is that it creates an artificial shortage. And the incentives then uh, lead to all kinds of screwy behavior. For example, with rent control, one of the things that you see is that the, the quality of the available housing will typically fall. And that's because with the shortage, landlords are no longer forced, the market forces, to maintain their places. And so they don't have to go to the expense of maintaining their apartments in order to attract tenants. Okay. That would be a price ceiling. Again, it's a maximum price that can be charged, and that's what makes it such. We situated this price ceiling here below the equilibrium price. When it's done like that, we describe it as being binding. And what it means to say that this price ceiling is binding is that it actually causes the price to fall. If instead we had increased, we had put this price ceiling up here near the top of the graph, of course, in that case, there would be no impact. That would be saying that it's against the law to charge a price in excess of this real high price ceiling up here. But if the equilibrium price is already below that, well, then that's, that's still consistent with the law. That price P1 would continue to be charged. Um, and so that would be a non-binding price ceiling. And I mention that because a lot of times people will think that what makes something a price ceiling is where it's located on the graph. But instead, what makes it a price ceiling is the fact that it's a maximum price that we're going to allow. All right, let's move on then to the other scenario where you often see price controls. That's when you see a price floor. This is really, really similar, but uh, the logic's kind of flipped around. With price floors, the worry is that the people selling the good are not able to get a sufficiently high price. So we want to do something to help those sellers out and pull up the price. Right? So in terms of the definition, then a price floor is just a government-mandated minimum price that we're going to allow. Anything is good so long as it's sufficiently it's at this price floor or above. Let's take a look. Again, I want to situate a supply and demand graph here on my board. The price on the vertical axis and the quantity on the horizontal axis. I draw a downward sloping demand curve and upward sloping supply curve. And let's draw the market in an initial equilibrium. P1 and Q1. So this is where we are to start, but it could be the case that we think P1 is not a good price. We want to do something to pull this up because those folks selling the good are being taken advantage of, or these folks selling the good can't make a sufficient profit at this low price. So to pull up a price, you might institute a price floor that looks like this, right? that says that any price that's at this point or higher, that's okay. Any price that's down below this is not allowable. Right? And so the impact is that the price will rise from P1 up to Pf, just like this. If you were clear on the logic behind that price ceiling, you can probably predict what's going to take place now that the price is deviating or moving away from P1. 
Now that we have this higher price, PF, moving over, the first curve we get to is the demand curve. That, and therefore, is going to show you the quantity demanded, the amount that buyers will buy at a price of PF. Read over further, once you get to that supply curve, the quantity that corresponds, QS, represents the amount that sellers are willing and able to sell at this price. Right? And again, that conforms with our intuition or our logic. Right? A high price, sellers think this is great, they start producing a bunch. And buyers, in contrast, think, I'm not so sure about buying this, they buy less. The outcome then, or the impact of a price floor, is that it's going to lead to a surplus of the good. And the amount of that surplus is, of course, that difference right there. Real-world example of a price floor is, of course, the minimum wage. Right? It's something that's being talked about a lot locally here in Los Angeles. Um, so one big concern that some folks have with respect to minimum wage ordinances is that they can create a surplus of workers and, in doing so, contribute to unemployment. Create a situation where there are fewer jobs available for those folks who are interested I think the analysis so far is fairly uncontroversial. Our price floors are predicted to create surpluses. Just how much of a surplus, uh, or just how much unemployment you might see when minimum wage laws are put into place is where you see disagreement and debate amongst analysts. Some folks will tell you that if you put in place a minimum wage, there's a relatively large unemployment effect. Other folks are going to tell you, yes, you might see some unemployment, but that impact is relatively small. And so I won't comment on which one of those is necessarily right or wrong. Instead, I'll leave you with the textbook analysis of the price floor. There you have it, price ceilings and price floors.